trust in God guided our nation's foundation and growth. And our founders placed the truth of God's gifts to us by including them in our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. These documents honor God's vision for mankind and for our country. It is faith that makes us strong as a nation and united as a people. Religious liberty created our nation and faithless to God will keep it strong. Hello, I am John Riddell, Director of Faith and Freedom Coalition Mid-Atlantic, an alliance between three states, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware, to build an organization that works to defend the heart of what is America, love of God and country. Through Catholics and Evangelicals of the Cross, through our Community Action Alliance, our engagement on issues in the public square, and being committed to educating, equipping, and mobilizing people of faith, and those who support freedom of religion and personal liberties, we will help to mobilize people to preserve that which God has given us, a nation and government that is the hope of the world. Our nation is greater than any political party and stronger than any enemy, for we find our courage in God, our strength in His Word, and our power in His grace. And we are guided by the Bible and the Constitution to keep America as the hope of the world and the beacon of freedom. If you feel this in your heart the same way as we do, then join us in this mission to retain the greatness of our people and to build a nation that our children will be happy to tell their children, your grandparents left us this. God bless America is not only a motto, but a prayer. Come and stand with us. God bless you all. Thank you. The uh, opening prayer will be by Father Mina. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for bringing all of us here today to encourage each other in following your commandments and in being really the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Our Lord, we need your help. We need your grace so that we can do what you want us to do. Our Lord, we need your help because Satan is working hard and we, without you, we can do nothing. But because you are with us, we can do everything in Christ Jesus. Our Lord, we ask you to Help everybody here who are trying to glorify your name among other people. We help you that you make all Christians to know that they have a part to do, that they wake up and that they stand for your principles and for all the values that you taught us. Our Lord, make us to focus on you as the moon focuses on the sun and that's how it lights through the darkness of the night. Help us to focus on you so that we can be the light of the world as you know, want us to be. Help us to be the salt of the earth. Our Lord, we thank you for people who are about to uh, get the awards for all the great efforts and actions that they are doing. We ask you to bless them so that they can do more and they bless us so we can do like them. With, the, with your grace, please hear us when we pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not in temptation but deliver us from the evil one in Christ Jesus our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Please Good evening. May God's blessing be on all of you with the knowledge that this event and all action are for God's glory. Tonight we host the first annual For God and Country event and George Washington Medal of Valor Awards. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that this is a Mid-Atlantic Alliance, 
a three-state joint effort to bring the faithful together to serve God, defend liberty, and to bring a Christian voice to the public discourse of ideas. I recognize the FFCPA leaders, Larry Denver and Charlie Beatty, Delaware's leaders, Jason O'Neill and Pat Riddell, New Jersey's leaders, Brenda and Mike Romes, for all their hard work for God and country. Three goals of our alliance are to vote kingdom, serve our nation, and serve our community. There are people here who lead these efforts. We ask them to stand and be recognized. Will all the pastors and priests and clergy please stand? Thank you for your faithfulness to God. Will all veterans or those in the armed forces please stand? Thank you for your service to our country. Will all those running for public office as kingdom candidates please stand? Please, what is your name? Cheryl, sure, Cheryl and Rob Arlett running for the U.S. Senate. Um, I believe um, there are some others here as well, Joe Pitts and Greg McCauley. So thank you for your taking the courage to be Christian candidates and running for office. Thank you for your commitment to both God and country. Fellow godly warriors and patriots, you are invited here tonight not only to help us honor these men and women of faith and courage, but you were invited here tonight to become those men and women of courage. We did not come here to be entertained. We came here to learn from the awardees how they found the courage through God to stand and fight when others turned away. We are here tonight to say that we will leave this ceremony and serve God with a public voice and unyielding praise. We will honor the sacrifice of all those who served and died to preserve our nation by working every day for the good of our country and for the glory of God. It is time to put down the remote and pick up those combat boots and kick some evil right out of our nation and our lives. You all know the movie Secretariat, and there's a great line in there from the book of Job. Do you give the horse its strength or clothe its neck with a flowing mane? Do you make it leap like a locust, striking terror with its proud snorting? It paws fiercely, rejoicing in its strength, and charges into the fray. It laughs at fear, afraid of nothing. It does not shy away from the sword. The quiver rattles against its side, along with the flashing spear and lance. In frenzy excitement, it eats up the ground. It cannot stand still when the trumpet sounds. Ladies and gentlemen, the trumpet has sounded. Speaking of frenzy and entertainment, uh, excuse me, freaking, speaking of frenzy, excitement, and sounding trumpets, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin serves as Family Research Council's Executive Vice, Vice President. He was one of the original members of the U.S. Army's Delta Force. He was privileged to ultimately command those elite warriors in combat operations. Later, Jerry Boykin commanded all the Army's Green Berets as well. Well, this is certainly a warrior who carries an olive branch in his left hand, and a sword of justice in his right hand. So when he offers his left hand, I suggest you take it. <laughs> you will not like the offering in the right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our Master of Cer Ceremonies, a true patriot, and more importantly, a true man of God, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin. <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, welcome. It's a privilege having you here tonight, and I am especially privileged to be able to be your master of ceremonies here tonight and as we give these awards. And uh, so I want to say to John, thanks, John, for uh, asking me to be here with you. And as I mentioned at dinner tonight, if you weren't in there, I do have some friends in here who uh, I've known for a long time, and it's, it's really good to see them. And uh, I saw Caroline DuPont Prickett come in 
a little earlier, so it's good to see Caroline. Where is Caroline? Oh, there she is. She's right over here with her sister that I uh, introduced earlier. So it's good to have you, and thanks to all of you for being here tonight for these, uh, this very special occasion. Welcome to the first annual George Washington Medal of Valor Awards Ceremony. The ceremony was designed by Faith and Freedom Coalition Mid-Atlantic Alliance to be given to those individuals or organizations that show faith, courage, and honor in defending the church and the faith, defending religious liberty, and defending our nation. These awardees show commitment in the face of strong opposition and at great personal trials and tribulations, oftentimes at great personal risk of danger. They inspire those around them to greater courage and strength. And as George Washington, our first president, said, the cause of our common country calls us both to an active and a dangerous duty. Divine providence, will wisely, which wisely orders the affairs of men, will enable us to discharge it with fidelity and success. Tonight we honor Raymond Cardinal Burke and Father Richard Heilman, Kellyanne Conway, Pastor C.L. Bryant, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, and the great nation of Poland and its very special people. Let all these men and women of the country of Poland who received the George Washington Medal of Valor tonight and servants of God, defenders of liberty and patriots of the highest order know that we in America respect them. I, uh, I campaigned with Ted Cruz. Yeah. Um, because I thought he was the right man to be the President of the United States. And then when it became clear that Mr. Trump was going to be the Republican nominee, I jumped ship on a heartbeat and got in his campaign and worked hard for him. But yeah, thank you. But before election night, I, along with other people, and I think, Rabbi, you may have been one of them, that we've met with him multiple times. We, as people of faith, both Christian and Catholic and Orthodox, we met with him. We had the opportunity to talk to him in, in great detail, and I think the Rabbi will tell you he's a different man than what you see on camera. He's a, he's, a, he's a street fighter on camera. And that's how he got to where he is. He's a, he's a street fighter. We're going to honor him tonight with this award. He'll be the, an awardee tonight. But there's a reason for that. Because as we met with him, we asked him, are you going to protect religious liberty in America? And I'll tell you a little story. We, uh, Tony Perkins and I, that's my boss at the Family Research Council, we brought him out to the Weston Hotel just outside Washington, out by Dulles Airport, and we had 139 veterans there. Half of them were generals and admirals, and the other half were all ranks. And we sat him down and we began to ask him questions. Tony and I moderated this, the discussion with Mr. Trump. And finally, we said to him, are you going to protect religious liberty in the military? And Mr. Trump said, yes, I'll protect religious liberty in the military. And not only that, I'll protect religious liberty all over this country. I'm going to go after the Johnson Amendment. And I'm going to repeal the Johnson Amendment. We didn't say anything to him about the Johnson Amendment, but on his own initiative, he said, I'm going to repeal the Johnson Amendment which has been an excuse for pastors not to preach the whole word of God. And I'm going to repeal it. And he said, and I'm going to protect religious liberty all over the nation. And he said, in fact, I just heard the story 
of a coach out in Bremerton, Washington, a football coach, a high school football coach, that after the games he was kneeling and praying on the sideline and they fired him. And he said, I'm going to stop that kind of nonsense. You know the story of Coach Kennedy? He said, I'm going to stop that. And we said, well, I said to him actually, I said, Mr. Trump, it's interesting that you bring up that example because uh, he's sitting right on the front row here. He's a retired Marine. <laughs> and it's the only time I've seen President Trump look like, are these guys kidding or are they setting me up? <laughs> I said, stand up, Coach Kennedy. Some of us were in Charlotte last week with Coach Kennedy at the Council for National Policy as Coach Kennedy and his lawyer told his story. We're hoping that now that we have a Supreme Court justice that actually cares about religious liberty on the Supreme Court, uh, at least another one that cares about religious liberty, that they will actually take his case. And that his case will get a fair hearing before the Supreme Court. So be praying. But this is a guy that was what I would have considered to be the most unlikely next president of the United States. In fact, I would have even called him ungodly. The difference is, his life has been an open book. His life has been in the spotlight because of his prominence, because of his wealth. And, uh, and then we look around at the lives of other men of lesser stature. And the only reason you don't know what they've done is because they haven't been as prominent as him. And we can't, we can't blame him for the life that he lived when we realize that he didn't get the right kind of training. He didn't get the right kind of mentoring. He didn't get the right kind of support as he was growing up. But he made some really bad decisions. So I was not going to support him. And then when I, the more I was around, the more I realized there's something here that is not obvious to people when you just watch him on TV. We went to him and he, he, was, uh, he made a lot of pledges. So in, uh, in April, after he was inaugurated in January, we went to him and said, Mr. Trump, you promised us an executive order that would protect religious liberty. We need that. We need that because of the people of faith that stepped up and not only voted for you, but supported your campaign. We need an executive order protecting religious liberty. Just out of curiosity, how many of you know that he actually signed an executive order in May of 2017? Most Americans don't know that. And then in August, Jeff Sessions, his attorney general, issued implementing instructions protecting religious liberty throughout the executive branch of our government. So every person that is on the payroll of the federal government is bound by these, this executive order. And the next thing you're going to see is you're going to see that being done to extend to all the country. That's coming. But then we went back to him and we said, you know, Mr. President, and again, it was people of faith. It was people of faith. We said to him, Mr. President, you promised to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Oh, all my people are in such an uproar over that. Okay. That ain't our problem. <laughs> Our problem is we got to go back to the people that we're here representing, and that's the people of faith, because they expect you to move that embassy because you said you would. I said I would, and I will. So to my Christian friends that say, "Well, I, th I think he's just a clown," I think he's. A, I, I say to them this: Go back to 2015 in Cleveland, Ohio, and look, envision on that stage there. 15 candidates standing there vying for, through a debate, the nomination on the Republican ticket. How many of them do you think actually would have moved the embassy? 
Only one. And he became the President of the United States. We do not have to like his background. We do not have to like his tweets. <laughs> but by the way, he reaches 400 million people around the world with those tweets. Do you really want him to quit? Seriously? Do you really want him to quit? He's a street fighter. But look at the data. Look at the statistics. Look at the economy. Look at the fact that we are no longer in a deal with Iran that put them on a pathway to a nuclear weapon. And the destruction of Israel, I might add. Look at the fact that he has gotten us out of this climate accord in Paris that was costing us, while the biggest offender was China, and it cost them nothing. And I do an entire presentation on the accomplishments of the Trump administration. I just did them several times last week, but I, I don't have time for that tonight. But if you believe that God raises up kings and rulers, and if you believe he raised up Cyrus for such a time as this, or he raised up a woman, Esther, for such a time as this. And we have to believe that God has raised him up for such a time as this. And I believe the day will come when he will turn his life over and completely surrender to the Almighty. I believe that day is coming. Some would tell you that it's already there. I don't know. But I believe that day is coming. But he has done so much to help America to be great again. And I think that it is fitting that he should receive this award tonight. President Donald Trump and Kellyanne Conway will be receiving the award. Please run the video. And that is because it's a bedrock because when you are raised in a faith-centric household, you realize from the very beginning that there's always something bigger and better than you. And that sort of that humility is a very important attribute to take to any position that has such great gravity and responsibility as I feel ours do in the White House. Um, I feel incredibly privileged and blessed to serve my country at this moment in this position. And if I approach it that way, I'm approaching it as a woman of faith um, and, and somebody who knows that for every time there is a season and that God places us in certain areas um, at certain points in our life. Now, the greatest professional privilege of my life is to work for the president, the vice president, and this great nation. The greatest privilege of my life by far is being mother to those four children. And uh, that nothing compares to that for me. And I actually think having, having a full life is very important to me because it really cuts down on all the noise and the nonsense and it puts things into perspective immediately and constantly. Uh, it's really great to be impervious to naysayers and critics. I turned my notifications off on Twitter in January, February, and it changed, it changed life. I recommend everybody do it. Um, Okay. Let me read you what's My actually... administration has spoken out against religious persecution around the world, including the persecution of many, many Christians. What's going on is horrible. And we're taking action. We are taking action. <laughs> we condemn all crimes against people of faith. And today, we are launching another historic action to promote religious freedom. I will soon be signing an executive order to create a faith initiative at the White House. The faith in Thank you very much. The Faith Initiative will help design new policies that recognize the vital role of faith in our families, our communities, and our great country. Today, we remember the words of Reverend Graham. Prayer is the key that opens us 
the treasures of God's mercies and blessings. Always beautiful. And when he said it, it meant so much. When I say it, it means something, but I liked when he said it better. Right? I think he did that a little better than I do. Reverend Graham's words remind us that prayer has always been at the center of American life because America is a nation of believers. We are truly blessed to have a vice president and a second lady who believe in the power of prayer and the glory of God. And they do believe. I'm with them a lot. They believe. The sweetest words the president and I ever hear are the words, I'm praying for you. And we hear it a lot. But that's really nothing new. The American people believe in prayer. Our country was founded on prayer. Our communities are sustained by prayer. And our nation will be renewed by hard work, a lot of intelligence, and prayer. Today, we gather to remember this truth. We thank God for the faith of our people. We praise God for the blessings of freedom. OK. Thank you. Let me read the uh, two certificates as I ask uh, Robert Lett to come up in preparation for the presentations. On this day, October 9th, 2018, the George Washington Medal of Valor is presented to President Donald J. Trump for his distinguished and courageous actions to defend and protect the United States while confronted with threats from our enemies at home and abroad. Although attacked by the media, his opponents, and foreign powers, he has never wavered from his duties to be faithful to the Constitution of the United States. While those who oppose him shake with fear, President Trump relies on God his duty to the Constitution and the will of the people. He stands with conviction that the United States of America is a great nation, in fact, the greatest on earth. He stands, as did George Washington, for God and country. And for Kellyanne Conway on this day, October 9, 2018, the George Washington Medal of Valor is presented to Kellyanne Conway for her distinguished and courageous actions to defend the role of a Christian woman in politics. In spite of being publicly attacked for her defense of life, speaking moral truths of her faith, and promoting honest policy in government, she inspires young adults to choose public service and to seek the right and just path of governance, one of honest moral and ethical actions. Kellyanne stands as did George Washington for God and country. And presenting or receiving this award tonight on uh, their behalf is Senate candidate Rob Arlett. It will be presented by Charlie Copeland and John Riddell of the local chapter here in Delaware. Well, on behalf of the President of the United States, does that sound great? I mean, it really does. Uh, truly, on behalf of the President of the United States and also Kellyanne, it is true honor to, for, uh, for me personally to receive these, uh, these awards on, on, on their behalf. I was the President's State Chairman in Delaware. Talk about faith. That's what this is all about. We are a nation of believers. We are a nation of, of followers of faith. And it is taking those of us who have faith to the next step, and that is, it's called action. The President of the United States is an action person. And I believe his campaign was one of total faith. 
Would you all believe? As do I. And along with that journey, I support the president to the point where as uh, we got involved and he won, our eldest son became the state director excuse me, the state uh, chair, the, uh, I was the state chairman, he was the state director for the campaign who ended up being, um, received a, uh, a, a nomination, or an appointment, excuse me, uh, in Washington, D.C. And, uh, and so he stood there in Washington, D.C., served our country at the age of 26 years old, uh, amongst it all, and he was proud to do that. He has now come back out on the outside. Uh, he is now our campaign chairman, uh, as we are running for the United States Senate here in the great state of Delaware. So it is our desire to not only accept this award on behalf of the president and Kellyanne, but it is our desire to have a righteous, faithful believer back in the Senate based on Delawareans. <laughs> so as we continue to move our nation, forward with faith and conviction and belief. I call on you to do the same. I call on you as believers, as our president has done, as Kellyanne has done, as our family has done. I call on you to move forward as believers and people of faith and people of action. As a Christian, we are commanded to do so. We are commanded to do so. We need more people of faith involved and not less. So I will take one other note, General, and as a Navy person, as a Navy family, our youngest son's at the Naval Academy now, it is a more of a reason for me to accept this on behalf of an Army General. So uh, I, I have to admit, so God bless you and thank you so very much, appreciate it. You got me. Okay, just wait till the Army Navy game and Huh? All right. Well, by the way, if you don't think God has a sense of humor, how many of you know that Tony Perkins, my boss at the Family Research Council, is a Marine? You know that? So I spent thirty six years in the United States Army. Got to the rank of three stars. I am working for a Marine Corps Corporal now. <laughs> it has humbled me greatly, let me assure you. I have not one ounce of pride left. Well, thank you very much. The, uh, the next two awardees are Father Richard Howman and Cardinal Burke. Please run the video. We are at war, ladies and gentlemen. The bloodless battle affects us all. Whether you choose to fight or you capitulate, no man is exempt, no woman excused. Few recognize the stakes, let alone are trained for combat. But make no mistake, the cost of being a casualty is devastating. The fight has now come full force. What was now done in darkness is now celebrated in the light. Even in Holy Mother Church, confusion, anger, division, and error have taken root, ravaging the spotless bride of Christ. Where before we were blinded, God's unfathomable mercy is opening hearts, opening minds, opening the eyes of people of faith. Throughout the world, men and women have been moved by only what can be discerned as a clarion call of the Holy Spirit to engage in spiritual warfare through prayer, fasting, and sacrifice. Ordinary men and women have joined forces along with their priests and bishops, physically surrounding their nations in active prayer. Our Lady's clarion call, the call once trumpeted 
at Quito, La Salette, Fatima, Trefontaine, and Akita is upon us. We in the United States share the conviction now seen and acted upon in the international community. First as a spark from Poland, then in Ireland and the British Isles to enter fully into the spiritual warfare we are now facing and to pray for our respective nations at this watershed moment in history. We are being called upon to help turn our country back towards God. We must acknowledge as a people that we have turned away from God. We have allowed the kingdom of Satan to enter in and assault us. We must confess our errors, turn away from the darkness, and repair what we as a church and as a nation have wrought. We will accomplish this through prayer that can change hearts, change families, change our communities, change our country and change the world. St. Padre Pio and St. Maximilian Kolbe both agree there is no stronger weapon in the spiritual battle than the rosary. We hear the clarion call of the Holy Spirit through the Immaculata and each of us sound the reply in the face of the battle around us. I'm going in. Let me read the uh, citation for the award as I ask Father Mina and uh, Brenda Rome's, both of the uh, Faith and Fa I mean, Faith and uh, Freedom Coalition of New Jersey, to come up to present the awards. The award reads: On this day, October 9, 2018, the George Washington Medal of Valor is presented to Father Richard Heilman, a dynamic Catholic priest from the Diocese of Madison, Wisconsin who has, by his prolific writings, been a beacon of truth, devotion, and fidelity to Christ and the Church. His national and international prayer movements, Rosary Coast to Coast, Novena for Our Nation, and Nineveh 90, and his popular blog have encouraged the movement of millions of Catholic faithful to protect life, preserve our Christian heritage, and uphold Catholic teaching. Father Heilman equips, mobilizes, and deploys Catholic prayer warriors when uncertainty and apathy threaten our way of life. For his fidelity to Christ, he, award, he is awarded the George Washington Medal of Honor. And let me just say, as I came up tonight, I'm not Catholic, but he came up and gave me a, a, a wonderful story about how they were making rosaries in World War II and actually giving them to our troops, which you could never get away with today. And he made this one and presented it to me, and it is made of gun metal, and uh, I shall be wearing this in the future. So thank you very much for that. And would you come up to receive the award, please? Well, I'm geeking out being behind the general here. And uh, especially, too, I'm geeking out by finally meeting Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. I've been following you since a long time ago. And uh, he's really helped a lot of people to really enter into, uh, in a deep way, into uh, understanding of what God's doing in our times. And I really appreciate that. It was 2015, right? when you pointed to those four blood moons and uh, entered into a new era. And I believe that. I believe we are in a new era. And I believe that uh, we've come to a point where 
uh, we are seeing a rise in belief in our time. Uh, this is, uh, I, I think we've hit uh, a bottom uh, for a period of time. I tell people that, you know, I had scripture scholars in, in seminary in the 80s uh, telling us that, uh, that miracles were like metaphors. Uh, the, the multiplication of loaves and fishes was uh, just a story of how Jesus shared his lunch and probably everyone else brought their own lunch, right? <laughs> And so that motivated them to share their lunch. And, and, uh, and they realized they had more than enough. So shouldn't we all share our own lunch? Right? But this is a particularly heightened time right now. Don't we know that as we entered Lent this year, on Ash Wednesday, February 14th, uh, we saw a very uh, tragic thing happen in a high school in Florida where uh, we saw uh, several students shot down by a gunman. But one of the most horrific things about that, if that isn't an, um, enough, was that um, as, the, um, as the police came forward and, and entered, they realized that there were four officers, uh, who one who was uh, just outside the building, and three that were behind, behind their cars in the school parking lot. As they listened, to one student after another being killed. They heard the shots of the gunmen and they stood their ground and they did nothing. Now, it was, it was hard for me and I know for you too. I love our uh, police officers very much. I got a bumper sticker uh, back the badge on my car right now. But uh, this was uh, not easy to take. I was scheduled to give a talk in a two days from that experience at the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in La Crosse, Wisconsin, to all men. And I completely reframed my talk at that time. And I uh, entered that talk and I said, do you see men? Do you see? They stood their ground. That's exactly what we've been doing for the last 50 years as one soul after another is being picked off. We stay behind our proverbial cars in our proverbial school parking lots, and we do nothing. I said we are called to enter the fight. We are called to pick up our weapons, whatever they are. For us as Catholics, we believe that we have been, it's been revealed that this rosary is a, is a mighty, mighty weapon. But whatever prayer, whatever way of believing, of offering your belief in the power of God, you see, this is what's happened. I mean, I was basically taught in seminary, don't believe in the power of God any longer. We've arrived. We know better. You know, your parents and grandparents and all those before you you know, they believed the earth was flat, too. We don't believe in that anymore. So church should be a nice little social club where we do nice things for people. We lost our understanding that God is the God of miracles. That God does answer prayers. And so what has happened over this past 50 years Satan's been eating our lunch while we sat behind our proverbial cars in our proverbial school parking lot and watched souls being destroyed one after another. Well, no longer. No longer. We are seeing a rise in our times. This is the dawn of a new era. We began this pan, pan, campaign you, you saw right here in 2016 before the presidential election. 54 days we prayed in advance of the election. It went from August 15th to October 7th. On the very day we started, the Trump campaign fired Manafort and hired Kellyanne Conway. On October 7th, when we concluded, the WikiLeaks were exposed. 
we said we need to still pray. In advance of the election was the Feast of St. Jude. You know about this, this saint? The, feast, the saint of lost causes, right? We decided to pray a nine-day novena in advance of the Feast of St. Jude on October 28th. You know what happened on October 28th? Comey stood up. We're opening up the case. Look it up. Google it. October 28th, the very same day. Listen. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Unless and until we get to that point, Satan will continue to eat our lunch. And we need to be united. Catholics, evangelicals, Christians around the world, everyone needs to unite in this prayer. That's what this has been all about. This, uh, this campaign now in this third year exploded. We had 1,300 sites from around the United States of people gathering to pray. We asked if you could to get on the, on the coasts and borders. Why? Because we're standing in the breach. Not my house, we're telling Satan. Get back. Vade retro satana. Get back, Satan. But we called upon God to bless this nation. Well, that call was heard beyond our nation. One thing led to another, and this thing exploded. This past Sunday, 57 nations from around the world gathered together. And we stood up, we called out to God, and we said, bring your greatest blessing. We are ready to stand up, to get behind, out from behind our proverbial cars in our proverbial school parking lots with your grace with your power. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can stand against the tactics of the devil. For we're not fighting flesh and blood here. We're fighting dark forces in the supernatural realm. With your strength, with your power, collectively we say to Satan and all of his minions, under the power of God, I'm going in. God bless you all. Let me just say that I am, uh, I'm actually from the South, and I do believe that somewhere in your genes there is a Southern Baptist preacher. <laughs> Underneath. Oh. Can you all see this? You see what it says? Can you see what it says? Make America holy again. God bless you. Thank you, brother. That's great. Thank you very much. You know, our next awardee is the nation of Poland. <clears throat> Let me just say before I, we, we do this presentation. Um, I think Poland is the greatest hope that Europe has, to be very honest with you. And the reason is because the, the church is very much alive and active in Poland. Even during World War II and during the Russian occupation where Poland was part of the Soviet Union, the church was very much alive. And they were a problem both during World War II for Hitler and, and during the Cold War for the Russian leadership because the church is alive and then reflect back on the fact that 
It wasn't long after the wall came down that uh, we had a pope from Poland. You know? And I think that the fires of, if there is, it is going to be revival in Europe, the, the embers of that are in Poland today. I also uh, like Poland very much because uh, I, I study World War II history, and if you go back to World War II history, the role that Poland played is incredible, but in America they've never been credited for it, and I don't know how many of you realize it, but it was actually Poland that broke the German codes. The enigma it was actually Poland which I believe was, other than the hand of God, was the single most important reason for victory over the Nazis. That was Poland. We need to be praying for the Polish people, for the Polish government, and we need to be praying that, uh, that the church will, will continue to grow and, and be an influence on the whole continent of Europe. So, let me read the... Citation for this award to Poland, and uh, I will ask, uh, let's see, uh, Father Hyman and Father Maluski. You'll stand in for him, okay. Poland has long been a defender of its faith and freedom. Throughout her history, and even in the worst of times, the Polish people have stood up with courage and conviction to defend their nation from tyranny. On October 7, 2017, more than one, listen to this, more than one million Polish people stood shoulder to shoulder along the coastline of Poland to pray the rosary, giving glory to God and asking God to protect their country and their faith. Poland is one of the USA's greatest allies the Polish people are, are an inspiring example of faith, loyalty, and courage. God bless them all on this day, October 9, 2018. We present them with the George Washington Medal of Valor, Long Live Poland, and receiving the award. Oh, let's see the video first. Thank you. I got carried away. I'm so excited about Poland. <laughs> let's, let's play the video. I pół tysiąca kilometrów polskiej granicy oplutł Różaniec. To wyjątkowe wydarzenie, w którym udział wzięło milion wiernych ze swoimi intencjami i z modlitwą o pokój w Polsce i na świecie. Różaniec do granic to akcja, w której granica była tylko umowna, bo do modlitwy przyłączyli się wierni na całym świecie. Waldemar Stankiewicz. Znieś nasze dłonie i modlitwę. się. Kodeń na granicy polsko-białoruskiej i tysiące wiernych, którzy przyjechali do sanktuarium Matki Bożej Kodeńskiej, Królowej Podlasia. Żeby modlić się za nas, za Polaków, za cały świat, żeby Najświętsza Maria Panna i Pan Jezus czuwał nad nami. Każdy ze swoimi intencjami i różańcem jechał do granic, by wspólnie się modlić. Jest to coś niecodziennego, coś wyjątkowego. Sama myśl, że wszyscy się modlą w tym czasie w Polsce, to, to dla mnie jest niesamowite. Najwytrwalsi zabrali różaniec i poszli na Giewont, pozostali u podnóża gór, odmawiali koronki. Modlitwa na granicach jest odpowiedzią na prośbę o codzienne odmawianie różańca, którą Matka Boża miała wyrazić 140 lat temu w Gieczwałdzie i 100 lat temu w Fatimie. I prosił Jan Paweł II, święty nas, wielki wielbiciel Matki Boskiej, w który pokazał, jak się na różańcu modlić. Więc modlili się i nad Bałtykiem. Nie przeszkadzała pogoda, jednoczyła wspólnota. Czuło się rzeczywiście wielki pokój, też pokój wewnętrzny w osobach, które się tu zgromadziły. Jest wspaniałym przykładem tego, że ludzie mogą być razem, ponad podziałami i tworzyć dobro. Modlitwa różańcowa jest właśnie takim wielkim wołaniem o dobro. 
Na Westerplatte spotkały się rodziny z dziećmi. Żeby się modlić za to dziecko, które jest w małym brzuszku i za całą naszą rodzinę. W święto Matki Bożej Różańcowej modlono się w sumie w 320 kościołach na obrzeżach Polski. I to jest super pomysł, naprawdę, żeby tak się zjednoczyć. Prawda? To jest bardzo duża i fajna akcja, która po prostu rozświetla nas na, na cały świat. Tak właśnie było na granicy polsko-niemieckiej, ale i poza granicami kraju. Modlitwa różańcowa jest dla mnie, powiem szczerze, wielką, wielką bronią. Wielką pomocą. Różaniec do granic to inicjatywa ludzi świeckich, wspierana przez dziennikarzy i aktorów. I o miłość zawsze się modlę na moim ukochanym drewnianym różańcu. I wspierana przez Kościół. Spotkanie powiedzmy po Światowych Dniach Młodzieży, drugie pod względem wielkości. A na dodatek także powiedzmy w Europie największe spotkanie modlitewne. Ta modlitwa wokół naszej ojczyzny to jest ogarnięcie światłością całej naszej ojczyzny. Ale gdzie jest światłość, tam jest i pokój, i radość. Waldemar Stankiewicz, Wiadomości. Before I, I, I bring up the recipient here, uh, how, how many of you like pierogies? <laughs> how many of you like vodka? <laughs> See, I can tell who's Southern Baptist out there. <laughs> I know who you are. There's, there's lots of both. So if you get the opportunity to go to Poland, receiving the award tonight is the Consul General of Poland in New York, Consul General Matthias. That is his Christian name. None of you in here but him and his wife can say his actual name, but he, it means Matthias. So Matthias Golubiewski. So would you come up and receive this award? My predecessor said that he was uh, nervous that he was representing the president, and I was asked to uh, represent the people of Poland. <laughs> That's 40 million people. <laughs> Most of them faithful, just as you saw in the pictures. I'm very proud to be Polish, and I'm very happy and honored to be representing my homeland, Poland, and receiving this special award. And thank you, General Boykin, Director Odell, everybody gathered here for this extraordinary privilege to be here. But as I said, I'm even more honored because you asked me to accept it on behalf of the, of the people of Poland, not just the government or the state. But that's very apt, as it is the people who are at the center of defending God and country, faith and their freedom, not the bureaucracy or the government, however fine uh, its goals and, uh, can be. So I'm humbled uh, also that we're talking not just about the, the living uh, faithful Poles that are now in Poland, but also those I'm receiving on behalf of those who came before us, who sacrificed their lives. We have veterans here. Over six million Poles died in the Second World War. Many more died in previous situations. And uh, their sacrifice was, they died with prayer on their lips. One of them was a certain man called Witold Pilecki, who was a, a, a volunteer in Auschwitz. He was a Polish officer. He was a, a humble man. But he decided to volunteer to go to Auschwitz and see what's happening there. He was also a very faithful Catholic man, a father, a family man. He went to Auschwitz, spent over two years there, writing his diaries. And when you read his diaries, he talks about, in those diaries, he talks about the, the power of the human spirit and how much faith have maintained people's dignity. Those who had faith, 
managed to survive in dignity. Those who didn't had problems. When he came back and wrote his report, and that report was sent off to the Allies, the Allies did not believe the Poles. When they told uh, Polish couriers, when they went to the United States to see the pres President Roosevelt or, or others, Winston Churchill, they, they did not believe. They said, look, uh, you seem to be very fine officers, but we cannot believe that such things is happening to the Jewish people and to you, too, to the Poles. But the Jews, uh, they could not believe that there was a Holocaust going on. But when he finished his mission, and when Poland in 1945 officially became the People's Republic of Poland, which was a communist republic under the Soviet tutelage, he was not recognized for his valor. He was put in jail by the Polish communists, and he was executed. And when his family met him before he, he was shot, he told them not to worry. He told them to pray. And we know it because the, the family, the great, uh, the, the, the grandchildren told this to, to us. He told them to pray, and, they, and he told them to specifically read one book, which was Thomas Akempis, The Imitation of Christ. He said, read that. It will help you in your life. And don't worry about me. These were the people that came before those who are alive today. These are the Poles that fought, faithful Poles that fought for Poland. But it's truly moving that it is the free and faithful people of the United States and no other country that, that are giving this award. Because I believe the US and Poland verily have a very special bond in this day and age. I can hardly think of any other modern Western countries that have managed to preserve the living faith, also in the public square, than the United States and Poland, frankly. While the United States cherishes its uh, allied relationships with countries like Great Britain, where your great parliamentary tradition came from, or France, I think these are truly fine historical friendships. But I think today, in today's reality of this world that we all talked about today, the friendship with Poland has actually a real dimension. Because it is somewhere deeper. It goes from the spirit and from the heart and from the faith of the people. And I think, again, if you were to think about any two Western countries that are of some stature, I think it's the United States and Poland that actually still carries that faith, and faith in the public square. Western Europe, unfortunately, has succumbed to this radical secularization to the point that being deeply religious is considered a curiosity. I'm a diplomat. I spend a lot of time in Brussels and in other Western countries. Curiosity sometimes a dangerous curiosity. When President Trump gave his speech in Warsaw, he he did it on purpose. He came to Warsaw because he knew he would be welcomed. And he talked about defending the West and Western civilization. He was talking to people who knew what he was talking about. He was not talking to people who considered those words strange. He was also the president that, just like the general said, truly cared about that relationship. And the proof is in the pudding. He realized that to defend that civilization, he had to put troops, American troops, in Poland, which is a great sacrifice. No country wants their children, their young ones, to, to be put in harm's way. But the American troops, for the first time in history, well, not for the first time in history, maybe I'll talk about it a bit later, but they were put in Poland as part of the NATO deployment on the eastern flank. It's a sign of true commitment that Poland is a, is a country which needs to be defended and also is a defender against what can come from, from the East to defend the Western culture. But Poland was not supposed to be this way. Poland was supposed to go down the secularization road. Communism, with its forced atheization programs, did all it could to make it happen. It went so far as to imprison its best priests, even the cardinal himself, Cardinal Wyszynski, who like, you, who, like those people who you saw praying on their rosaries, created a novena in 1966. He created a year-long novena for the millennium, 1,000-year celebration of Poland receiving his baptism. That was the man they put in prison because he said, non possumus, I disagree. You cannot treat the church this way. He was put in prison for many years. He came out, luckily. Some others, like Blessed Father... Jerzy Popiełuszko, who may 
some of you may have heard about, was clobbered to death, put in a sack and dropped in a river to drown and die. What was his sin? Celebrating Holy Mass for a free Poland. That's how we called it. Every Sunday in Warsaw. For that, for supporting the Solidarity Movement and the, move, and the movement of free people, that priest was... He didn't want to see the pictures when they recovered his body from the river. Dear friends, Poland and the United States have also understood something that many countries of our civilization have not. They understand to this day that there is no contradiction between freedom and faith. In Europe of absolutist monarchies and state-established religions, uh, many, many centuries ago, it was Poland that was the beacon of freedom. Already in the 15th century, we had our parliament in place. We celebrate over 500 years, 550 years of our parliamentary tradition this year. A staunchly Catholic country, for sure, but not forcing anyone to convert. Our great King Sigismund once asked about how it is possible for him to tolerate the Jews, the Protestants, everybody else who was flocking to Poland to escape persecutions in Western Europe and religious wars that we never had in Poland, famously quipped, I'm not the king of anyone's conscience. And remember, he was an elected king. Poland elected their kings for over 220 years. Your country is 241 years old. We had an electoral tradition already then, and George Washington knew that, and people who were starting your country knew that, and I think the problem was no term limits. <laughs> <laughs> so the, George Washington said, look, I cannot be an executive for life, even though that, that tradition in Poland is very beautiful. <laughs> But because of that great tradition of religious tolerance and religious liberty in Poland, at some point, Poland harbored three quarters of world Jewry. And it was called by the Jews themselves, Polin, which supposedly in Hebrew and some version of the language means rest here, rest peacefully here. So America and Poland are the countries of the free exercise of religion, and no law should ever, no law should ever try to govern our conscience. And I think those two countries know it very well, and we know it very well. Ladies and gentlemen, the irony of Poland's situation, and mind you, I'm sorry, I'm Polish. If you get a Pole to speak to you, it will be history, <laughs> a lot of history. But the irony of Poland's situation was that it paid exceptionally, uh, it paid for its exceptionalism uh, very, very dearly. Its absolutist neighbors, those absolutist monarchs, invaded it and deprived it of its sovereignty for all of the 19th century in the first 20 years of the 20th. And it's uh, an honor for me that it came back to life exactly 100 years ago. And I'm the Consul General in New York, and I celebrate this year. It's my honor to be in the United States to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Poland, regaining its independence this year. <laughs> and I would like to remind you that Poland came back to life in many ways, if not singularly, apart from the military valor displayed in the battlefields by the Polish soldiers, because of the United States. And it's then President Woodrow Wilson, who made a point of making Poland sovereign at the Paris Peace Conference. Most Poles truly believe that Poland would not resurrect if it wasn't for the American position at the Peace Conference in Paris. President Coolidge, should then not have been surprised when in 1926 he received 111 tomes of signatures. He got a package from Poland, from the highest level of Poland's government throughout the clergy and five and a half million Polish students. Signatures thanking the United States for supporting Poland's independence. Can you believe it? Five and a half million Poles, and most of them students, signed a letter to President Coolidge Thank you, the United States, for supporting Poland and gaining its independence. So thank you to this day. <laughs> that is a friendship and alliance. If those terms ever had come closer to the proper definition, I think that's friendship and alliance and it's best. But it would not exist if, the, if, if America and Poland were not bound by the same spirit, as I said, that this award that I'm so honored to have received on behalf of the Polish people encapsulates. Today, Poland is a champion of what George Washington called ordered liberty, 
a God-fearing nation committed to building the common good through free enterprise, cherishing the family, valuing the dignity of every human being from the day of conception, constitutionally protecting marriage as the union of man and woman, <laughs> and reorienting re the government to work for the people, not against them. Poland has joined recently the group of so-called developed countries at the uh, FTSC Russell Index. If you, ever, if you care, if you're investors, Poland right now is a developed, not a developing country. It's been growing economically constantly for the past 30 years, never hit a recession. It's a country of 40 million people. It's the seventh largest economy in the European Union. It's a gateway to the European markets. It's doing really, really well, and I think the president in the United States recognized this that Poland is not uh, a, uh, uh, an ally, a small ally, but actually a valuable ally that can now contribute on the world stage. And Poland would love to be that bridge, uh, that transatlantic bridge for the, for the United States. The story says, and President Trump mentioned that in his last year's proclamation, establishing uh, Kazimierz Pulaski Day, that at the Battle of Brandywine, General Pulaski led a charge that averted a defeat of the American cavalry and saved the life of General George Washington, which earned him the rank of Brigadier General in the United States Continental Army. How many of you knew that? Wow, I'm impressed. <laughs> and it so happens that the award that I'm holding is called the George Washington Award of Valor. And I would like to dedicate it to the memory of our common heroes, like General Pulaski and General Kosciuszko, whom you probably also know, and many more. But also those who are Americans and fought for Poland's freedom like the American pilot volunteers of the Kosciuszko Squadron that fought in the Polish-Bolshevik War of 1920, the B-17 Flying Fortress pilots who dropped supplies on, the, on Warsaw during the Warsaw Uprising at the cost of their lives. I think seven of those pilots died, crashed, they were shot down. And now the American troops that are stationing Poland to once again, through deeds, not words, show American commitment to Poland and to safeguard the culture of the West. So uh, let our joint traditions of faith and freedom guide us. And I would like to quote Pope, Pope John Paul II that you mentioned kindly before, a great friend of America, and I think he understood America very, very well. He quoted that to an American ambassador to the Vatican, and he said, he quoted John Dickinson, chairman of the Committee of the Declaration of the Independence. He quoted, and I quote, our liberties do not come from charters, for these are only the declaration of pre-existing rights. They do not depend on parchments or seals, but come from the King of Kings and the Lord of all the earth." Unquote. God bless you, and God bless America and Poland, faithful and free. Thank you very much. Our next awardee is uh, a, a, a man that I have known for a number of years now, and I consider him to be a very good friend. It's Rabbi De Jonathan Kahn. You all know of him. You have seen him, heard him speak, or you've read his books. So let me uh, let me read the award certificate here for Rabbi Kahn. On this day, October 9, 2018, the George Washington Medal of Valor is presented to Rabbi Jonathan Kahn for his unwavering commitment to God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and for leading others to repent and return to the gospel. He has said that barring a miracle of God, the die is cast for America, which has garnered him enemies at all levels, even in the church. Yet he has stood strong in faith and true to God and has continued to deliver a message of hope that he must seek the will of God. His preaching and writing have led many to return to God. And presenting the award to him tonight will be Charlie Bailey, Beatty, sorry, of the uh, Faith and Freedom Coalition of Pennsylvania and Pastor Marcus Almonte. So if you guys would come up.
Okay, there's a video for this? Okay. Can I just tell you it's not in my script? Yeah, you... All right, let's see the video. You get a C on script writing, okay? At best, C minus. Go ahead, let's see the video on Jonathan Kahn. Seeking for the one whose heart is completely his. For the one who is not afraid to stand against the darkness and shine into it. The Lord is searching for the one who is not afraid to be different and make a difference. Who's not afraid to go all out. Who's not afraid to rise. You be that one. You be that people. You be that because you can do more with one of those than a thousand of those who have compromised. Because with one of these, he can change the world. You who are standing with him and doing his will without comfort, you be strong. Here's the word, be strong and of good courage. And the Lord will be with you. And you will reap a harvest if you don't grow weary. Don't grow weary. The Lord is with you. In the beginning of the age, the people of God stood in the midst of an ungodly culture, an anti-Christian spirit and persecution. But that did not stop them one bit. In fact, they were the greatest, most anointed, most history-changing, most world-changing people this planet has ever known. So too, we find ourselves in a, a similar like situation. That means it's time for us to stand as they stood, to believe as they believed, to pray as they prayed, go forth, to proclaim as they did without compromise, to blaze as they blazed, and to change our world as they changed theirs. It's time to put away every shade of compromise and take up the mantle that God has given us. It's time to be the salt of the earth we were called to be and the light of the world you were called to be. It's time to be strong, not weak. It's time to be bold, not intimidated. It's time to be radical for God. The watchmen of, are crying out. The trumpets of God are sounding and the voice of God is calling to America saying, return, return, return. And the voice is calling those who are lost, return and I will receive you. The voice is calling to his own people saying, return and I'll shine my glory in your life. Let the word go forth of God. Let the lost, return. let the trumpet sound, let the light of the world be the light they were meant to be. Let re our prayer, let repentance break forth in this land, beginning with us. Let righteousness blaze like a mighty, a mighty river, says the word of God. Let salvation go forth and let God have mercy on this land and save this city on the hill. As it says, America, God shed his grace on thee. Let revival break forth. Let revival break forth in the government, uh, in the main street. Let revival break forth in the heartland, in the cities. Let revival break forth on the old and the young, on the saved, on the unsaved. As it is written, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Let every valley be exalted. Let every mountain and hill be cast down. Let the crooked way become straight. And let the rough way become a plain. And let the glory of God be revealed. And all flesh seed, for thus says the Lord, Kumi ori kiva orech, arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you in the name of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. The enemy cannot stop the word of God. Amen. But in the name of Yeshua, we know that, Lord, all our efforts are nothing without your power. So, Lord, we ask for your power. Lord, here in, in Delaware, where the Constitution was first ratified, All right, this is a public service announcement. I said you got a C for writing my script. No, I got an F for presenting it because show the video is right here in writing and I fouled up, so I apologize. Come on up, Rabbi.
don't go home with that. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, General Boinkin, my friend, and my friend John and Pat, and all of you in the, the Faith and Freedom Coalition. What you're doing is crucial. Don't grow weary in it, because it's important. God has called you for such a time as this. I want to give you a prophetic word I'm led. We are standing at a most critical moment. The ground has been shifting beneath our feet. The moral and spiritual foundations on which Western civilization was founded, upon which it has stood for 2,000 years, are now being swept away before our eyes. And a culture birthed for the purpose and the glory of God is now warring against those purposes. 388 years ago, the ship called the Arbella journeyed across the Atlantic. And on that ship was John Winthrop, who had penned the founding vision of the civilization that would be called America. If we would follow the ways of God, he wrote, he shall make us a praise and glory. We must consider that we shall be as a city on a hill. That vision would come true. America would become the most blessed, prosperous, powerful nation the world has ever seen, and a praise on the earth. That vision was based on the template of ancient Israel. In the history of the world, only two civilizations came into being solely on the foundation stone of God's word. The first was Israel, the second was America. From the pilgrims of Plymouth Rock to the Puritans of Massachusetts Bay to the leaders of America's first colonies, America's calling and purpose was proclaimed over and over again. It had come into existence solely for the purpose of glorifying God. No historian can rewrite that fact, and no government can expunge that. But we have forgotten that Winthrop's pen didn't stop there with the vision of the city on the hill. It went on to embed into the soil of America's foundation a prophetic warning. He said this, If our hearts shall turn away, from our God, if we all turn away to other gods, our pleasures, our prophets, and serve them, we shall surely perish. The same warning given to ancient Israel, because America was founded after that pattern. But ancient Israel drove God out of its government, out of its culture, out of its public squares. It celebrated ungodliness, called evil good, and called good evil. It lifted up its most innocent, its children, and sacrificed them on the altars of Baal. So too America, the city on the hill, founded for the glory of God. We have likewise been turning away from our God, and we all know it. We have driven him out of the government, out of the culture, out of the public square. We've called evil good. We've called good evil. We've lifted up our most innocent our most helpless and slaughtered them on the altars of self-obsession. We become a civilization polarized in spiritual schizophrenia. We have witnessed a Supreme Court that opens its session with the words, God save the United States and this honorable court go on then to strike down the very words of God. We've seen presidents place their hand on the word of God to assume their oath of office and then with that same hand enact laws that war against the very word upon which they swore the oath. That which once dwelt in the shadows of the American fringe have now, has now become its mainstream and now holds sway over the culture. And that which was once the heart and mainstream of American civilization is now attacked and driven to the fringes. What was once worshipped and celebrated is now vilified. What was once vilified is now celebrated and worshipped. We have profaned the sacred and we have sanctified the profane. So it was in the fall of ancient Israel when the nation turned away from the sacred, turned to the obscene. When they ceased to worship God, they lifted their children to the god Baal, the deity of self-obsession, increase, gain, sexual immorality, and the offering of the innocent. So America in turning from God of our foundation, we have also turned to the spirit of Baal. We have witnessed his spirit increasingly take possession of the culture. And the sign of that spirit, the sign has manifested. In the autumn of 2016, 
the sign of Baal appeared in the land. An ancient arch began rising up in New York City. It was the Arch of Baal, the arch through which the worshipers of Baal would enter to venerate their deity. The ancient sign of a nation that once knew God but now had fallen away, the sign of a nation that once held life as sacred but now held the murder of its most defenseless as a sacred rite. And now we have just witnessed a fury concerning the future of the nation's highest court, a fury to protect the practice of the killing of the unborn. If a thousand angels swore on a thousand Bibles to the contrary, it would not change one jot or tittle of the most basic of moral axioms that to kill an unborn child is an act of the most stark and vile evil. Amen. And America's Collective hands are covered with the blood of millions. And on the day before the most recent conflict of the nation's divide came to its head on Capitol Hill, an object appeared on the mall in front of that hill. That object was the Arch of Baal, the sign of that deity that seeks the life of a nation's children. And, and it happened just the day before that hearing came to its head. And yet the victory of that spiritual force was held back. Thank God. We are now standing in a most critical moment. The nation's future is hanging in the balance. As it happened with the fall, the judgment, and the destruction of ancient Israel, we have likewise been given a space, a period of grace, a window of time, a reprieve, where the doors have not yet closed to religious freedom where the gospel can still be spread unhindered, and where God's righteous people like you can still freely touch the halls of power and the lives of multitudes. But it is a window. There has been a political change, but there has not yet been a moral or spiritual revival. There's been no turning in American culture, so it has continued to go downward. And it's because of this that there is such a fury against the forces holding back like the pressing of a flood, the floodwaters against the walls of a dam. If America does not turn back to God, there is no hope for America. For Washington is not the answer, Wall Street's not the answer, Hollywood is certainly not the answer. There's only one answer, and his name is high above all names that are named, all powers that reign. There is only one agenda that will save America. It is not political, economic, or military. It is the agenda of revival. We've been given this window that we might pray for revival, work for revival, speak for revival, minister as never before for revival, and beyond that, to start living in revival. Because if we start living in revival, the revival starts here and now with you, and nothing on earth can stop it. For the Lord has promised, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and pray, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. The key is my people, that's you. And the key word is if. For if we live in a culture driven with the spirit of Baal, then it must be that we are living in the days of Elijah. And if we are living in the days of Elijah, it is time that we once and for all rise up to become the Elijahs of the day. And so you, ministers of God, you people of God, faithful people, it is time that we move from being a comfortable people to becoming a prophetic people. The graves are disappearing. The time of compromise is ending. The time of wavering back and forth, it's over. The time of fearing is over. This is our day. This is the time of the Elijahs of God. For those of you who've been praying, Lord, I wish I had lived in biblical times, congratulations. You, your time has come. Your wish has come true. These are the same days that the prophets walked and the apostles walked. And if the darkness is growing darker, it is time for the lights of God to shine more bright and more powerful. And if the bad is going from bad to worse, it is time for you to go from good to great. These can be the greatest of times because it's the black of the darkness of night that manifests the light of God. It is time to become radical, people of God. 
It is time to become fearless. It is time to become bold. It is time to rise to our calling. It's time to pay the price. And it is time to become great again. For the eyes of the Lord are searching the entire earth. And that is the promise that is for this day. And they're looking for that one. You be that one. We stand at a critical nation, a critical point in the nation, standing between two gods and two altars, and the voice of the Lord cries out, choose you this day whom you will serve. If Baal is God, then serve him and go to hell. But if the Lord be God, follow him and he shall lift you up. We must here and now declare with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength that our God is not Baal. Our God is not any other created thing. We have come here to declare there is only one God, and he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel and of all nations, and he alone is the rock upon which this nation exists. And from this place we make the commitment and the declaration we shall not bow down to Baal, we shall not bow down to political correctness, we shall not bow down to any idol or any god or any decree that is against the word of God. We shall bow down our knees only to the Lord our God. Come what may, let the chips fall where they may. For some do trust in chariots and some trust in princes and some trust in governments, but we shall trust in the name of the Lord our God. The name above all names, above all kings, above all powers, we will trust in the only name given by which we can be saved. We will trust in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, King of kings, Lord of lords, light of the world, glory of Israel, and the foundation on which this nation has come into existence, the only hope, the only chance, the only way that America has that it once more may shine again with the light of the fire of the presence of the glory of the living God. Amen and amen. God bless you. How would you like to follow that? <laughs> and our last award tonight, and I'm sorry that he is not here because he is also a friend, uh, is Pastor C.L. Bryant. Play the video, please. So it was, I got a lot of shots to the, the head. United States of America. As I travel around this country, sometimes shaking unfriendly hands, sometimes telling people that they need to pay heed to what has gone on in New York City last year. Last year, there were more black babies in New York State killed in their mother's womb than were born. When I tell that to black churches, and I say that we should not kill our babies, amen, Reverend, you're right. When I tell them that we should not condone same-sex marriage, Amen, Reverend, you're right. But those same people will leave that church and go to the voting booths on Tuesday or Saturday and vote for principles that is against their core beliefs. This is a trend that will destroy this nation. And so as I travel around this country, sometimes shaking unfriendly hands, I, it is always good to know that there are people like you who are praying for me, praying for this nation. 
that God will have mercy upon it. So there is one more question that I have for you. Are there any patriots in this house? Is there anybody in here who is going to defend God and country? Is there anybody in here who will defend the republic? Is there anybody in here that will stand up for God and country? That will stand up for the republic? That will stand up for church? Then patriots, stand up! Stand up! Stand up! God bless you. How would you like to hang around with him and Rabbi Khan for one evening? Huh? I'm telling you, it doesn't take a lot. Yeah. Hey, brother, I was taking care of you. You gave me the rosary. Okay. You hear what the father said? He said, thanks for putting them first. Oh, putting the Catholic first so he didn't have to follow them. All right. Let me read the certificate to uh, Reverend C.L. Bryant. On this day, October 9, 2018, the George Washington Medal of Valor is presented to Reverend C.L. Bryant, who, as a pastor, recognized the government policies were creating a victimization mindset among African Americans. His conservative views raised the ire of the leaders of his church. He illustrated his Perceptions in a film called Runaway Slave, yeah, which led to a parting of ways with his church. In spite of being the local leader of the NCAA or NAACP, he lost favor with the organization when he refused to speak at a pro-choice rally. CL took a stance for the truth of the word of God and for liberty when he stated, once you secure freedom for yourself, it's more precious than any gold, any treasure you could have. Reverend C.L. Bryant. Presenting the award tonight for uh, C.L. Bryant is uh, Larry Denver of the Pennsylvania Faith and Freedom Coalition. Larry. <laughs> receiving, receiving the award for Pastor Bryant today tonight is Reverend Dean Nelson, who is also a very good friend and works with us at the Family Research Council, so it's good to have you here. Too. Stated, my name is Reverend Dean Nelson, and I did have the opportunity earlier today to speak with Reverend C.L. Bryant, and he gives his heartfelt uh, uh, encouragement to faith and freedom, and he was sorry that he could not be here this evening. But I am pleased to be able to receive the award on his behalf. Before I say official words, I want to say thank you to Faith and Freedom Coalition, and particularly to Larry, and also to John. Just want to encourage you that you guys are doing a fantastic job, and I want to encourage you to continue to do what God has called you to do. People may misunderstand you, minorities may criticize you, but you know that you are doing the work of God. And I want to encourage you, continue to be a bridge to communities of diversity, because God sees it ultimately, and I believe that he will reward you in that great day, in saying, well done, good and faithful servant. It was about 2010, I was in Atlanta, Georgia. I had an opportunity to host about 50 African-American pro-life warriors who were gathered for a couple of days to decide on how they would fight back against America's largest and most notorious abortion provider, Planned Parenthood. 
While we were there, a preacher with a camera, a video camera, called and said that he wanted to come and to video some of these warriors in terms of what they were doing and the strategies that they were taking to challenge the uh, abortion giant. He came in and he took photographs and he shot video of people like Alveda King and Star Parker, myself, and a host of others. And after he got video footage of that event, he asked me if he could join me in Washington, D.C. at a Frederick Douglass Foundation summit to actually capture more of these black pro-life uh, warriors as well as patriots who had committed themselves to fighting against the liberal and progressive tide that had infiltrated much of the African-American community. C.L. Bryant came to Washington, D.C., and he got great footage and produced what now became the blockbuster documentary, Runaway Slave. If you have not seen that documentary, I would encourage you to see it. It paints a much different picture than what you will see if you watch CNN, MSNBC, or your network news in terms of what's going on within the African-American community. You see, a lot of people look at what's going on from the outside and they don't understand that there is a revolution, a commitment to God that's going on within urban America where they are fighting and standing for what we know is the truth of Almighty God. And I believe that Faith and Freedom along with the Family Research Council are examples of organizations that are not more committed to politics than they are to biblical truth. And I don't know about you, but in my Bible, it speaks of, in the book of Revelation, that in that great day, that it says that all nations, all kindreds, all tribes, tongues, are going to gather before the throne of God to worship God Almighty. That is a picture of what heaven looks like. And if you don't have a picture of what that is in the eternal, then you may not get an opportunity to see it here in the natural. But I promise you that that's what heaven looks like, and that's what our home is going to look like. Not a segregated heaven, but a heaven that is filled with people from all kindreds, all backgrounds, all races, tribes, and tongues. That's what I look forward to in the great day. C.L. Bryant, as a preacher with a camera, used the technology of this day to communicate spiritual truths to ignite a fire within our culture. Similarly, in the 19th century, Frederick Douglass, the namesake of the organization that I lead, born in 1818 in Talbot County, Maryland, would become the greatest abolitionist America has ever known. Frederick Douglass also, many people don't know, was the most photographed person of the 19th century. Why? Because he wanted to use photography of his day to show that a black man was more than a caricature than most people saw in the newspapers in the 1800s. He wanted to show dignity and worth for all people, and so he used photography during his day, photographed more than Abraham Lincoln, more than anybody during his day, to show worth and dignity, because the Word of God states, what? That all men, what, are created in the image and likeness of God, regardless of what uh, hue or color he is. Frederick Douglass used the technology of his day, and so I think that it is fitting that we would honor and I would be able to stand in this place for my good friend C.L. Bryant because he also, a fiery preacher, using the technology of our day to communicate spiritual truths to let America know, as Frederick Douglass once stated, and he said it this way, he says, the, my, my, I have a simple idea about politics. He says, my politics is, is that righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. He says, that's the whole of my politics, the positive and the negative of my politics. Similarly, Frederick Douglass would state that it is easier, regarding the family, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And for those of you who like the Second Amendment, he said that a man's rights are secured in three boxes. The ballot box the jury box, and the cartridge box.
This year marks the 200th birthday of the great American Frederick Douglass. Many people in our country don't recognize the fact that President Trump signed into law and it was actually voted 100% by Democrats and Republicans, all members of the Senate and the House voted unanimously to make this year the year to celebrate the life and legacy of Frederick Douglass and every American should be proud of that. I was selected by President Trump to serve on that commission. And myself and a host of other colleagues are doing everything that we can this year to help people remember the true legacy of Frederick Douglass. Now, I know this isn't a partisan gathering. I'm just quoting him because Frederick Douglass did say that I'm a dyed-in-the-wool Republican and would never be the part of any other party except the party of liberty and progress. We need to know our history, all of our history. Frederick Douglass was not just a quote-unquote black American hero. He was an American hero. And all of us should do well this year to learn about the life and legacy of our great American Frederick Douglass, who was a minister of the gospel, who served five presidential administrations, who was an ambassador to Haiti, who had an encounter with God at the age of 13 and said that the Bible was the greatest book that he had ever read and that he would use by God every, I, everything that he had within him to advance the cause of righteousness and justice. I'm going to read for you as I close some words from C.L. Bryant, not Frederick Douglass. <laughs> but Reverend Bryant asked me to read this. I don't know, General Boykin may laugh at me. I turned 50 this year, so I need to put these on. It says this, I want to thank the committee and particularly my good friend John and Pat Riddell. I also send my deepest regrets that I cannot be there physically with you to accept this huge and incredibly humbling honor. That this has been bestowed upon me is a great achievement, recognizing my work as a disciple and minister of my Lord Jesus Christ, a national conservative activist, a radio host, an award-winning filmmaker by God's grace. I also want to, want to thank my dear friend, Dean Nelson, for agreeing to accept this award on my behalf. He lastly says, in the DNA, he wants to remind you, in the DNA of every true American is a thirst for liberty, freedom, and friends, we must pray that these shall never be extinguished from the American spirit. God save our republic, and God bless America. Thank you so much. Okay, I'd like to ask Larry Denver to come up now. Well, that is not a humbling affair that we just witnessed. Uh, I'm just, to stand up here where these people stood and spoke truth to us, it just blows my mind. It's just unbelievable. So, Dean, you just turned 50? I just turned 70. <laughs> but these are just still just readers. Faith and Freedom Coalition um, has formed uh, several years ago, a number of years ago, through the leadership of John Riddell down here. Um, and then we formed the three chapters together between New Jersey, Brenda Rooms, and myself in Pennsylvania, and, and uh, John Riddell in Delaware. And we formed it as the, the Mid-State Alliance. What the Mid-State Alliance does for us is it allows us to be much more effect, uh, uh, efficient and effective in what we do. We do operate independently of each other, but we also come together in events like this to make sure that we 
gain the moral support, the spiritual support that we need, that we require to do our work, that we might not get by our, on our own. It's not easy to be out there all the time doing what we're doing. So it's, it's through this alliance that we do this. It makes us much more efficient and effective. Everyone in our organizations, all our state leaders, we're all volunteers. We all, no one gets, has a paid position. We all work as volunteers. We're working for God. This is where we, this is the end of the day. This is where everything goes. It, all the glory goes to God for what we do. Um, you've seen some of the things that, that John talked about in the video for the Mid-State Alliance. As anyone who has operated a nonprofit organization who is completely dependent on donations and, um, and giving, you know that we're always working on a ragged edge, on a shoestring, and that this tonight is actually this, I don't know if you knew it or not, but this is a fundraiser. So, <laughs> so um, anyone who has operated a nonprofit organization, uh, we're totally uh, independent of each other. National does not give us any money. We're part of the National Faith and Freedom Coalition. We don't send them money. They don't send us money. But one of the purposes of tonight's events is to try and raise enough funding to take our organizations to new and higher levels that we have not been able to do up until now because we're always on an edge. So if we can gain enough funding tonight, we can start to begin to do things that are even reach new plateaus as far as our fight for liberty, as far as our fight for religious freedom, as far as our fight for right to worship in the public arena the way we feel that we should, okay? We're gonna take a free will offering. We have some ushers and we hope that if you see value in the work that we're doing, if you see value in, in the things that you've learned tonight, um, that you will dig deep and you'll help us out. And um, on your seats, we have these envelopes out there. So if you wanna take these home and write a check when, when you get home and mail it in. We'd certainly appreciate that. Um, if you don't have envelopes, there are some between the two doors in the back. Any, it says Pennsylvania, but all the money that comes in through these envelopes will be split uh, evenly between the three states. Okay, so that's what that does. Okay, so if we can have the ushers come forward. While we do this, I have a couple of comments I'd like to make besides that. First, I want to thank Pastor Sloniker, the, the lead pastor of this church, for allowing us to come here and to have this event here. So let's give the church a round of applause. Some of you may or may not know that we had scheduled to have this event at a, at a local college in Pennsylvania. Well, they came after signing the contract, they came back at us just less than two months out from this event and they said, well, we're not gonna let you have it here. They just cut us right out. So there have been any number of, of um, roadblocks and, and things that have been thrown out in front of us, but we are so blessed. We're blessed that you're here all tonight and we're blessed that um, you had an opportunity to hear these great leaders that we have in this country that you would never ordinarily get to hear. Okay, we have very important elections coming up in less than a month. How many knew that? <laughs> How many of you are registered voters? Boy, I better not see any hands go up, not go up. <laughs> in less than a month, we cannot, we cannot afford to sit this out. I mean, this circus that we just watched in Washington is what's going to happen to this country if we don't maintain the House and the Senate. Everything will come to a screeching halt. We do not have the opportunity to sit at home. We don't have the opportunity not to speak to our friends and neighbors and our coworkers about this, about the importance of what we have in front of us here. Our Faith and Freedom Coalition chapters, we teach that it's our responsible and duty to vote our Christian values first. We're Christians first. When people ask me, well, who are you, Larry? I'm a Christian, and then I'm a patriot. 
That's, that's who I am. And that's who we all need to be. We need to not vote a particular party, not vote a, a shiny personality, not vote a particular race. We need to find the, can the people, the candidates, who are most in line with our values, most in line with the things that you teach your children across the kitchen table, most in line with that. I'm not saying it completely because you're never going to find that perfect candidate. But there is one out there. And if he happens to be in a different party that you're in, then it's our responsibility to choose that person. I mean, there's no doubt that God uses unlikely people to do his work. Just look at the White House. Okay? I mean, that is it's very clear that God uses un, the most unlikely people. The fact that I'm even standing here is living proof that, <laughs> believe me, if you knew. So, we need to vote kingdom. Hashtag vote kingdom. Do that. Remember that on Tuesday, November 6th. We have to do that. Do your homework. Find the candidates most aligned with your faith and beliefs and get them elected. And then once they're elected, hold them accountable. Right. We have to follow up with these people. We have to keep the microscope on them. They need to be held accountable. And that's what happens so often is we've elected good people who get corrupted and we can't allow that to happen. Not anymore. It's too, it's too important to us right now. Mark Twain wrote these very wise words on September 2nd, 1904, okay? That's a long time ago. Listen to these words from, from Mark Twain. It will be conceded that a Christian's first duty is to God. It then follows as a matter of course that it is his duty to carry his Christian code of morals to the polls and vote them. Whenever we, he shall do that, he will not find himself voting for an unclean man, a dishonest man. If Christians would vote their duty to God at the polls, they would carry every election and do it with ease. In 2012, 39 million Christians did not vote. Half of them weren't even registered. If Christians would vote their duty to God at the polls, they would carry every election and do it with ease. Their prodigious power would be quickly realized and recognized, and afterward there would be no unclean candidates upon any ticket, and graft would cease. Maybe. <laughs> if the Christians of America could be persuaded to vote God and a clean ticket, it would bring about a moral revolution that would be incalculably beneficial. It would save the country. How many of you believe that? Okay, we need to take that message outside these doors. That's not something we can keep in here. It needs to go outside the doors. Pastors, church leaders, I know there's a bunch of you in here tonight, and we are blessed to have you here. But I hope you take this message to heart. In the next 30 days, and in the less than a month from now, Take the messages you heard tonight back to your churches. Teach your congregation. Lead your congregation. Be the ones that stand up first. It's our obligation as leaders to lead. Okay? We need to take action now. It's past time to stand in courage. Courage is courageous. These men that were here tonight that got awards are people of courage. Great courage, and we need to learn from them. We can learn from them. So I thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. We're not quite done. <laughs> Hang tight. We have a couple other things to do. But we are blessed. You are blessed to be here tonight, and I'm blessed to be able to stand up here in front of you. One of the things that uh, Pastor Sloniker asked that I mention is that on Friday, November 16th, at the church here, uh, from 7 to 9.30, they're going to have Thanksgiving remembered and evening to honor the American and Pilgrim Foundations of Faith, Family, and Freedom. So this flyer will be out there. Charlie, would you come up with those things there, please? We promised everybody who came in here tonight that the... How many of you still have your ticket? Oh, good. <laughs>
Okay. We have these two limited edition prints. One of Abraham Lincoln. Oop, one of George Washington. These are prints that come off limestone engravings that were engraved in 1860s. The, the, the engravers of these were contemporaries of Courier and Ives. These, there was only 50 of these made, and we have, limit, we have the limited edition prints, okay? So these are door prizes, so I will pull a ticket. How come that one's taped at the bottom? <laughs> okay, 291, 236. 291, 236. Becky, which one would you like? We'll have someone take it back to you. Which one would you like? George Washington? Okay, we'll get that back to you. John? And one more. How about 291-259? Perry. 291-259. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. We'll get this back to Perry. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, we're going to have some con concluding. Oh, before this is, when this is over, before all the guests leave or the, the speakers, awardees leave, we, we need to have you come up and get a group picture. So don't, just don't run off, okay? John? General Boykin has some. Yeah, General Boykin had to leave, uh, but he, he, he's flying out tomorrow uh, on a mission, so he had to leave. So the end is tonight because we've said all we had to say, and we can't repeat anything as beautiful as our speakers did and our awardees did tonight. So we ask uh, Bishop Desi Turner to come up and close us in prayer. Thank you all for coming, and God bless you all. So stand. Hasn't the Lord been good to us tonight? Who wouldn't want to serve a God like this? Amen. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us on tonight to come together in fellowship. You made it clear to us, unless you watch the city, we watch in vain. Lord, we've brought our crosses, our rosaries, our Bibles, come together as one, but what binds us together is faith. You said, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You told us without faith it's impossible to even please you. You told us to fight the good fight of faith, endure hardness as a good soldier. So tonight, God, in your son Jesus' name, we stand in our authority. We walk in what you've given us by the power and anointing of the Holy Ghost to fight this fight. God, continue to give us courage Lift us up. Let us keep our heads up, our chest out, O oh God, and not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us continue to fight this fight and, and keep the course. You heard, I've heard you say over and over again to me to keep, keep the course. Keep the faith. Stand and fight. Don't give up. So tonight, God, we're standing together as one. One mind, one heart coming together, one heartbeat, coming to fight against evil wherever it comes from. We thank you on tonight because you are God and God all by yourself. So now as we leave this place but not your presence, keep your loving arms around us. Keep your protective hand over us. But most of all, keep us in the center of your will. And we will be careful to forever give your name to praise. In your precious son Jesus' name, we pray, we do say, thank God, amen, amen. and amen.